Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. Would it be safe to say that, you know, when you're in construction, you got to be proactive because you have deadlines, you got to get things done. And if it's anybody drops the ball at the deadline point, the only person anyone looks at is you, you know, it's your fault. And so you got to be very proactive at getting the right people, staying on schedule, getting things done, having the right materials. And so being proactive as a way of life did, uh, when you, you get knocked on your can from this, and this is an important thing for, uh, you know, the people who listen to this podcast to hear is you're not, you cannot assume you're going to be healthy your entire life and that you're not going to have uh, something weird, a, a stroke, or you can minimize the chances. But, uh, you know, I talked to a cardiac surgeon this summer and he said there was a, a person, a runner who had done five marathons in the previous six months and he had a blockage. And so they had to do open heart surgery on this guy who was extremely fit. So you cannot just say, I'm going to eat right. I'm going to do the right things and I'll be exempt. None of us are, can be, you know, like Grant Wall, I don't know if you heard that, but uh, the guy who wrote for Sports Illustrated, he's a big soccer Yeah, it's very sad. Very and, sad. Uh, uh, he looks a lot like you, by the way. With him. <laughs> and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, he he just, you know, they said it was something slow growing, a slow growing aneurysm inside of his head. And his brother accused the Qataris of poisoning him, him for his political views and this, that, the other. You, know, you have all these things that come up and they say, oh, my bad. It was just, uh, it was something they could. And they said if there had been oxygen on the scene, any kind of thing, admit it, he was still gone, you know, because it was internal. And so we don't know that we can avoid facing things in life, but you can be proactive once you recover from the gut punch. You know, I don't know, you know, like you said, you're incapacitated with heavy doses of drugs to kind of shock you back and get you on the right track. But as soon as you get the least bit of energy, you can start being proactive and getting yourself out of the hole. And how, what, what did, what steps did you do to start? being proactive with your health, but also in your business. Like I, I need an income here, you know? Yeah. So, well, so I should point out that one of the things in my journey is I also became an EMT. So uh, I currently uh, do some volunteer work and some uh, contract work as an EMT, uh, which I love. It's my, it's a very, very big passion of mine. Uh, but that the purpose of that was sort of get me to have a, a little bit more academic understanding of sort of medicine and how the body works and whatnot. So um, that was something proactive that I did for my health and for my family uh, to, to be, to have that skill set. And so for my business, what I did was I started, I, I was presented with this extreme restriction on my time. And so I had to figure out ways that I could optimize, automate, and outsource all the things that I was doing in order to actually get them done because I just didn't have the time or the energy initially. And so I just sort of did experiment, just did an experiment with my body. I experimented with productivity techniques. There were all sorts of new tools and things that were coming out at the time. And I was just using things in different ways. And uh, it, people started to notice. Um, and I was writing blog posts, which then turned into classes that I was teaching in person at the time. And then those turned into books and eventually coaching and consulting and speaking and all those different things. Uh, so it was really that idea of of uh, and, and eventually that became what's called a replaceable founder. So how do we make ourselves as replaceable as possible? Because one way or another, you're getting replaced at the end of the day. And how did that thought occur to you? Well, I'll tell you, to reinforce that thing, uh, if you're building a business, the thing to understand, it only becomes a business when it can operate at high efficiency with you not there. And so... The idea from the beginning of starting your business <laughs> is to replace yourself so that you don't have to be there, that you know, that you have a business that, that you actually have a business rather than you created 
a, you know, a job for yourself, you know? And yeah. so I always say uh, owning your own job. Yeah. Owning your own job. You know, the Michael Gerber, uh, uh, e, e myth, uh, idea, but how did this, how did that come to you and how did that impact you when you first got that thought clear in your head? So I actually had a professor in at Wharton who used to say, uh, don't ever be irreplaceable because if you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted. And that always right. stuck with me. And I love that expression. Um, and so the, for me, it was like, well, um, if I don't, if I'm not here, not operating, not pushing, you know, my hands aren't on, on scene, like the business runs so all, right? So I have to make myself more replaceable, which there's a whole technical and logistical aspect to that, but there's a huge psychological kind of ego aspect to that that I deal with with clients all the time, uh, becoming more replaceable because then they like, what's their value then? Which is, it, it, it's, it's farcical when people get in that mode, but it happens all the time. Uh, so it was, um, it was just that idea of extreme restriction. And the example I always like to give is like MacGyver. You know, so you look like somebody who might have been a MacGyver fan. Yeah. Um, yeah. So not, 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 not by joy, by, by necessity. Yeah. By necessity. There you go. So, so nobody ever said to Angus, hey, man, look, we go across the street to the Home Depot, grab whatever you need, come back over here, and we got to take this building down. Right. It was always like, here's a paper clip and like a, a piece of a life vest, like you need to blow up this building and you know, you would do it. Um, so that to me, that it's like that, that restriction is what breeds innovation. So I would create in, in the case of the Crohn's, I had a legitimate uh, uncontrollable restriction on my time, but I took that into other aspects of my life or my business. Like, well, what if we could do this in an hour as opposed to three hours? What if we could do this with a hundred dollars instead of $300? Like, what would that require? Even if it sounded crazy, you know, what would that require? And a lot of times it worked out. Yeah, you see that all through art, too, to develop the... Uh, oh, oh, by the way, that's David Oliveira calling now, who I was telling you about <laughs> earlier. Uh, the thing is that you get to where you're, you're, you have limitations and you can waste time worrying about that. But the truth of it is, in all of the creative worlds, they uh, encourage people to uh, give, uh, you know, to artificially restrict yourself. I'm only going to work on this size paper. I'm going to work in this medium, and I'm going to see what I come up with. This, you know, two colors, monochrome, or I'm, a, you know, I'm only going to work with oils. And uh, and in photography, it's like I'm only going to have one lens. You know, leave one camera, one lens. I'm going to go for a month. And I'm going to restrict myself to like a 50 millimeter lens and then see what I can come up with rather than taking all of this baggage. In fact, uh, my brother worked for 40 years with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. And, uh, you know, they were purists with all of the uh, analog stuff and everything and not a lot of gimmicks. And he told me one time that uh, Mike Campbell, the uh, lead guitarist, the one who came up with that, lead, you know, the lead for American Girl. Uh, and by the way, he's the he's he's the lead uh, guitarist for uh, Fleetwood Mac now. But he uh, showed up at a he told me about a, a recording gig. He was helping somebody out. He showed up with just his guitar and one pedal and a guy from one of the other bands that we've all heard of. Uh, he showed up with basically three roadies, trunks full of stuff, <laughs> you know, to took an hour and a half to lay everything out and for the same three minute, two minute little blip, you know, and uh, Campbell just walks in with a guitar and one pedal and knocks it off and, and steals the show. And so if you're forced, you know, you can get yourself all caught up in the peripherals and not uh, and miss the point of the content, you know, what you're trying to get done and make sure that pops. And so what do you do? Uh, with the people who can't let go because, you know, that starts, I think that starts with people are in, in corporate structures and they're afraid that if I train so-and-so to do my job, then they're going to let me go. I'm going to lose my job. And so I've got to make myself uh, irreplaceable, but you can't really grow in life. It, if you make yourself like that, you never will be promoted. And so uh, great insight from the Wharton Professor, where does where did that? Uh, how do you get people past that point emotionally? 
if they're founders? Uh, it kind of depends on the person. It kind of depends on their situation. And so you have a few different sort of personalities there. There's the people who just don't know there's another way to do it, uh, which we which I see that all the time. And they're a little easier there. It's more like, hey, look, you can do it this way. And they're like, whoa, okay, great. That's the easy one. Then there are the ones that uh, it's a real issue for them. And like, it's their business, their baby. They have to be there, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that is, that's when I have to become like more of a therapist, honestly, and start to really dig into why they feel that way. And it's usually some, uh, entrepreneurs are, are, are usually psychologically damaged people. I'll, I'll just say that right now. Yeah. Um, and so, and a lot of times they're taking out their psychological damage on their team and their company. I often say that as I, the more and more that I do this, the longer I do this, the, the more I feel like my work is about protecting the entrepreneur's team from the entrepreneur's mind. Um, and so <laughs> repeat, uh, repeat, a, repeat, a lot that of time, please. repeat that, please. Uh, <laughs> I, I find that a lot of the work that I'm, I do uh, with my clients and my, and the teams they're working with is that I'm focused on ways to protect the entrepreneur's team from the entrepreneur's mind. Um, you know, there's a, there's an old joke, which is, you know, why don't, why don't cowboys skydive? Because it scares the crap out of their horses. Yeah. Right. right? So, the, and that's the thing is like, that's the entrepreneur's team in many cases. Entrepreneurs have, you know, they think every idea is the best idea they've ever had. And then they send people in all sorts of different directions and it creates stress and anxiety. It's, it's, a, it's horrible. And this is like, I, I mean, there are some entrepreneurs who are incredible thinkers. There are very, very few entrepreneurs who are good at running businesses. Very few. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, I have worked with probably well over 2,000 different companies. And so uh, this is based on anecdotal evidence, but quite a bit of anecdotal evidence. So, and that, that's fine because they, they still have a huge amount of value. They just recognize what it is. So sometimes it's a small shift in that way, just sort of getting people to see that the damage that they're doing in some cases, or the lack of innovation they are actually providing for business and sort of a better value, you know, like the, so the grass is greener kind of approach. Um, and then the third kind are the ones who have, and it's still sort of a psychology thing, but, but a lot of it's like a trust issue. So it's slightly different than the ego issue. There's the trust issue, whether they don't believe that either they've been actually hurt by someone or something, they've been stolen from, they've been, you know, whatever it might be, or they just get into this state and it's not an ego thing again, but where they believe that the thing that they do is so specialized and so high level, that there's just nobody else that could possibly do it. And that's just, it's very self-limiting at that point, right? Because A, I would argue that if you can't teach something, you don't actually have mastery of it. Right. That's, that's the first one, right? So if you say you can't teach it, then you probably have a master either, which means there probably is somebody who has. Uh, and then the other part of that is that... Uh, the, we can do more things nowadays. With There's people that can, and there's software that can do things that for years we needed a person to do and spend their time doing. And it's just not the case anymore. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whitealamwinning.com. Thanks for listening.